All right. <laughs> I got water. So, look, I have to say this. Um, I was said, okay, you want to come and sit around a table with a few people and just have a casual conversation. And, uh, boy, uh, so I, I didn't come just prepared. I mean, I, I have a million talks I could give, but I, we have a chance to have a conversation. And, and I'm trying to see if we can make that manageable under these logistics. And, uh, but actually, I don't want to waste your time with, uh, with stuff. So I, I thought I could kick it off, but I'm happy to have just questions and, and to respond, which maybe because it, if I did a presentation, there's tons of them on my website. You can just play back a videotape, right? So, and, and that's harder to ask a question. But it's your call. I'm actually really open, but this, which maybe frightening um, f for you, but, um, but I thought I, I could put up, if the slides work, I, I have a single slide I could throw up. And let's see if, oh, sorry, you're right, I'm an idiot. A C, A, B, C. You told me that already. The other C, A, B, C. <laughs> I'll go back to see. I think I got it. Hang on. Make sure I've pushed through a button. This is great. This will help solve, answer the question about presentation or not. Uh, okay, bingo. So, um, you know, since just to get things rolling, I thought I could talk a little bit about something I mentioned in a, just a conversation of an hour ago, but around design and where design fits into the development process. And I, I did a book, if you're at Mix last year, you got this uh, sketching book in your bag. And the, my friend who designed the book was a guy na named Henry Chung. And Henry right now is a studio lead for IDO in Chicago. But he is trained as an architect and he worked with Ram Coolhouse and, and OMA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture, um, on the Seattle Public Library, which is this building here. And so I, I have some inside dope on this building that I, in some sense, is really revealing about how I see design working in our industry, or better placed, um, how design is not working uh, in our industry. And, and I think that actually, if you look at a building of this scale, it can teach us really a lot about, because it's a, it's a scale that's comparable to a big hunk of code or a big system in terms of organization and complexity and scheduling and so on. So I think it's a non-trivial project and it's an interesting project. And the first thing I'd say about this is it's right off the bat, is that there's, you have the client who commissions it, the Seattle Public Library, but then you have basically three elements that are going on in making this building work. And one is you need the engineering, the structural engineer, who says, why isn't that lacy glass thing falling over, that cantilevered part up on the top, for example? Um, so you need a structural engineer. You need an architect, in this case it was from OMA. And you need somebody to make sure that the business works from the financial part, that it's a building that's affordable, it doesn't go over budget, and that not only once you've built it, that you can afford to maintain it, and, and that it serves its function. And this actually reflects exactly the structure of what was going on with the mobile uh, Series 7 phone, is that we have adopted and started, for me it was a conversation with Steve Ballmer about three years ago, to saying, We've got to change the culture so that business, design, and technology have an equal footing on every project. What's now we reduced to what we call UX, BXT, business experience and technology. That every project needs to have an equal partner, an equal status at the table on each of these three disciplines. You need the same depth in each of those professions, and you need the same level of creativity in each of these professions. And each is essential, none are sufficient on their own, and 
their success depends on them, how they intertwine and work together. So they also need the personality types to be able to work together. I'll give you an example. Pretend this wasn't a library. You want to build this cantilevered thing out? Can't do it one way. The structural engineer says, you can't do it this way, but we can do it that way. We'll lat realize your di design intent. So the first thing is, the structural engineer had to understand that there was such a thing as a design intent and understand what might be another alternative and also know how to bend their expertise in materials and construction to make it happen and offer it as an option. On the other hand, there's another relationship how this could go. The structural engineer knows this designer has a particular kind of style. The structural engineer has this whole new kind of material that allows the new types of things to be built and says, hey, I can offer you this. What can you do with that? And the architect responds to being able to make use of these new types of materials. It can go either way. It's not design-led or engineering-led. They're partners in crime with different expertise. And then, of course, they have to have the financial person make sure that it works. So if it's too, it'll stand up now. We've got this great design with new materials, great creativity in the materials, great creativity in the design, but we've got a problem financing. The financial person might say, well, look, if you add another floor to the building that we can rent out for retail, that will provide the economic base to allow us to do realize your intent, but you're going to have to adjust your design to fit the other floor. Can you do that? And what I think every one of us knows is that there's no such thing as design-led. I'm the, the design god, and you build what I say, or else you're, you're gone. Or the engineer, or anything like that. It's design and successful product design is a compromise. And it's a compromise amongst people who represent the key elements that are essential for the product success in a respectful way that understands the value systems and intent and where you win when everybody loses the same amount as opposed to one person winning and, and the others not. And that's how these buildings happen. But let's look at what's actually the process. And that's the part that I found really interesting when I was talking to Henry about this. The left is a scale model of the building where the right is the finished building. And it's important to notice they're similar. Um, now, it was in November 1998 that the call went out for proposals. This is the RFP. Say, so we, we've decided on a building where it's going to go, and, and now make us a proposal. Um, the building opened in July of 2004. So right there we see, okay, so this is actually a six-year project, if my math is right. And uh, it was awarded in May 1999. Now, what's interesting is it, that's when OMA won the contract. Now, what's interesting is before the call could go out, they had to know what the hell they wanted to build and how to specify it. The designers didn't do the specifications. There's a the thing. And so, in fact, they hired another architectural firm and architects to help them that were not going to get the contract to do the call. Now, you might want to call that project planning. And there was a whole period of work before that. I would argue that more work went into that design process than most software products have in their whole product. And that wasn't even awarding the design thing yet. So if you come through there, what I like about this example is to say the construction didn't happen until March 2002. So you can basically say the preliminary design happened between May 99 and March 2002. Well, actually, it probably started as soon as they decided to bid in the contract, which is probably around December 1998 or January 1998, because you had to put in the proposal. All on spec, everything before it was awarded. This is the most striking thing for me in terms of what I understand about how designs happened in my experience in the software industry. There on the left-hand side is a scale model of the building, and there is the final building. You tell me, that's the same building. I want you to notice where and when it was built, that model was built. Now, this is a conservative. This is December 99. That's the earliest we've been able to date it so far. Next time I'm in New York, I'm going to talk to the architect to find exactly when it was built. But that's Henry's best record. He had no documentation of it before that. But that says, well, your job's done, right? The design's done. There's the building right there. See? It's finished. 
And that happens in most cases in design within software that you sort of say, well, we've got the screens all done, we've got the flow, so the design's done, okay, now let's build it. Because that's what people think that the look and feel, the model, is the design. When in fact, no, it's not. What the designer provides are engineering drawings, blueprints. They're not sketches and, and, and 3D models. That's way, way, way at the front end of the process. That's when you start the real hard part of the design, is when the model comes out. And I think that if we look in our own projects, we'll find that very often um, we're, we start building right off the bat. Notice here, construction didn't start until March 2002, despite that model existing in December 99. It's pretty interesting compared to how we do things. And I know the industry is different, but okay, here's the construction phase. And then what's interesting, you thought the design maybe ended when the construction started. And what actually happened, Henry's job on this building was to do all the interior environmental design and the graphics and so on, the signage and, and the colors and the, to help the flow. Now, it's insane to imagine that no matter how good you are at 3D visualization and reading 3D models and graphics, and no matter what you have in terms of virtuality, it's not the same as being in the building. If you specified the interior colors and all of these interior details before you started building, you're basically eliminating the possibility that the architect, in walking around the thing that they designed, might, in fact, be able to gain some insights about the material that would, having lived with it for a while, that would improve the design. So the key thing here is to say the design when you're in the ideation phase as opposed, as opposed to doing the blueprints, depends on what level and the hierarchy of design you're working on. So, for example, the design that's happening here at the, at the right-hand side, the further right you go, is, is more and more about the detailing. The colors, the carpets, the, the doorways, all, all the fixtures and stuff like that. And just making final adjustments, sometimes even to the walls, the non-structurally you know, load-bearing walls, so that you can get the building really the best you can as you learn about it while you're building it. Geez, that sounds a lot like code to me. Um, but, and so, primarily the design's happening before construction, but it's happening right through. But notice this arrow, the construction started, sorry, the construction finished, essentially when the building's opened. But the building had been delivered and signed over, and notice, Henry was still working. The design actually wasn't finished until the people had moved in and they're actually using it because there's some design decisions that you can't make properly until you've actually seen the building occupied and actually been able to test because you're not going to get it right. And that's part of the architecture's firm uh, responsibilities. And so I love this model because it is at such variance. The design budget, the architectural fees, are typically on the order of 17% of the construction costs, of the cost of the building. For a firm like OMA or Frank Gehry, it could run as much as 25%. And I guess the question is, could anybody who works for a software company that expends at least 17% of the development costs on design put up their hands? Because I'm taking mine down. Yeah. And so the question is, is that, is that appropriate? or not, and I, I don't have the right answer to that, but it's a really interesting question about where does it fit in, what's the relationship about the financial side, the, the, ar the architect and the engineering side, and I also noticed that within the software industry that the engineers who are in charge of the construction have a very different training and skill set than the structural engineers. And, and what I'd say in the software industry, we might actually get a, go a long ways if we did something like said, what if the person we call the architect on the, on the product, I think it's actually a structural engineer in many cases. And by the way, that's no insult. The structural engineer is doing desi engineering design, right? It's, it, it's just as creative, it's a different thing. But let, if we called them 
either the systems architect, which is what many people do, but, the, but, the, but, the, but if we call them a structural engineer in some sense, in software there is no architect. And typically the people who have a design background are coming in at the back end to put lipstick on the pig, so to speak. And they have no say in the terms of the overall design of the product. And my sense is, is that if we've done as well as we have under that structure, that's not a bad thing. It's actually really encouraging because it says, what if we actually were tr trained and, and structured to do it right? We could do spectacular things. And, but the question is, how do we actually organize the whole team and, 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 and get these different disciplines working together and, and recognize that even with a structural engineer, that's a different kind of computer scientist than you want actually writing device drivers or dealing with the real-time signal processing parts of the system and so on. And, and figure out how do we have these relationships and organize accordingly. And I think that for me, the, it comes down to is that my world at Microsoft is as much about in terms of design projects is as much about how do we help change, the, uh, redesign the culture and the organizational structures of how we develop products as it is as any product we design. And I'd say that on any project, and I think that's, if Windows, if the, if the, if the Series 7 phone, mobile phone is as, if it, if it meets its potential, I think it's largely because there was about as much time spent in terms of the organization of the team and the culture as there was in the, invested in the product in terms of innovation. And I think, and I think it shows. And, uh, and I think we can do better, even there. But it's a really nice start. And, and I think, I don't know, I, that's really, I, I don't want to milk this thing uh, uh, anymore other than to say, Sometimes these types of analogies where you step out of our own profession and find appropriate things that mirror us back, we, because none of us, unless you're an architect, have vested interests in, in architecture. So we can actually see them more objectively and then see does it, how, to what degree does this stuff apply. I understand that the materials are much better known in many cases in architecture than they are in computer science. And that, but, I also think that there's more here in common than, than, than maybe I even noticed or understood until I'd picked Henry's brain fairly dry on the topic. So with that, I, I, rather than blabbing on, I, do you want to talk? <laughs> there's some microphones here. And, uh, and if you do, if you just go to the microphone, if you, just, if you don't mind, and then people can hear. And, uh, and if I... And I'll do my best to answer short, but, it, but, but if there's also, um, rather than asking a question, if you say there's something really burning you that you want to talk about um, and just say, okay, could you say something about X? I'm happy to do that as well, because I'm happy to do whatever you get the most out of this uh, from. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Um, I like the parallel, and uh, in the software industry, I think there's a, a a lot of unusual use of the word design or designer. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, the, the vision you have of who is the designer or who are the designers when it comes to software as opposed to the coders, opposed to the graphic designers, opposed to the UI, UX, uh, architects, those kinds of things. Who do you see the team of designers being? Yeah, so I think the, the first thing is, is to acknowledge there is a team of designers because I mean, Frank Gehry doesn't design buildings. He, he does, he's part, and part of the team and he brings some vision, but he, he's clearly this, the work is spread, spread out. So and then the question is how does that, how does that workload come? For me, the, when I use the word designer, uh, it does, it's not a, a synonym to creativity. Um, and it's not, it, and I, I'll, I'll state it outright. You could say everybody's a designer because they make creative decisions and stuff like that. But I would say that as I'm using the term, there is a professional, there's a professional competence that is comparable to professional competence of being a programmer in terms of a, a, a well-defined discipline that takes years of study and that 
uh, is distinct from business or computer science that I would call design. And it's characterized largely by a different approach to thinking. You know, the, the trendy thing to say is design thinking, but I, I, I'll, I'm happy to identify some of the attributes that characterize what I would call design thinking versus creative things that aren't design thinking, but are nevertheless great ideas. Um, the second thing I'd say is that um, within that group, everybody, yeah, of course everybody has some certain amount of design in them, uh, just like everybody has a certain amount of musician in them. But if everybody is a designer because, for example, they can, they're really good at arranging furniture, the clothing, or things like that, that's like saying everybody's a mathematician because they can't change uh, when they come out of the grocery store. And, and, and so it's a difference between a certain professional practitioner versus this level of literacy and a basic competence that I think we all want. In the types of teams we're talking about, it's critical that, let's just take the three, there's actually more than three, but in this BXT type of thing, they are not, they're not pillars. Uh, my friend uh, Bill Mugridge talks about those T-shaped people. They, they have depth. The pillar's the depth in their, in their discipline. The base of expertise they have collectively is the base of the collective pillars. But they're a T, and that T basically goes, says that they're not as deep. They have literacy, they have awareness and literacy in the other disciplines, because when I put them out like that, and that gives them a common language and sets a common ground so that I'm literate as an engineer, I, I'm literate about design and literate about business. My view is, is that uh, there's a friend of mine, Don Lindsay, he's now the VP of Design for Research in Motion, and he, uh, but he was the designer of OX9 uh, at Apple, and uh, he, he uh, <laughs> has this great thing, there's a reason designer rhymes with whiner. And, uh, and, and in saying that, he was kind of how the designers were saying, all these engineers don't understand me. And, and so my reaction to that is, just saying, I said this um, earlier thing to someone, that, but uh, if you as a designer don't know as much about the engineer, their aspirations, their heroes, their culture, and their discipline and the stories as you expect them to know about you, then shut up. Go do your homework. And, and I'd say the same thing about the engineers who went about the designers, so, well, not understand them. It, it, there's a f social contract if we go into this kind of team where we, uh, that I'm going to try and teach you maybe who Frank Gehry is and you're going to teach me who uh, Donald Knuth is or, or uh, Nicholas Vert or, uh, or Tony Hoare and, uh, and why they're really important people. And, and so it's this, these types of things. Decisions are being made all the way through. The design thinking part is characterized by a few very simple things. I call it sketching. but. When you give me something, I'm going to come back and give you five different answers. I went and was talking to Steve Ballmer about uh, mobile phones and stuff, and, and I went and, and I followed exactly what he was saying. And he started saying, wow, you, nobody does that. And I said, well, yeah, this is, how, this is what we do for a living. And I went with seven different things, concepts, each equally valid, each you know, very, very distinct. And the rule is you're not allowed to want any one of them. It's, the purpose here isn't to advocate for any one of those designs. It's rather to say, I'm going to populate the design space with as many distinct samples so that we understand the terrain that we're trying to cross. And the better we understand the terrain as an explorer or whatever, I can now start to make decisions about how to navigate through it and what's the best route. But if I'm trying to advocate for one versus another, I'm biased and therefore I'm trying to lead you astray. And and then the process of how you negotiate that, come up with the ideas and the process of then how you mediate through those and make decisions through things like critique, that's what designers do. It's not a reductionist incremental refinement of a, along a single thread. And it's just a different way of working. Neither's right, but neither's wrong. But if you're approaching a problem and you have the engineering approach, which is in psychology, psychology experiments different than the design approach in concert, and using these two different methodologies, you'd come to the same place, or to a third place where you would, neither would have come to on their own. You can have far better confidence you've got a good decision than if you only have one mindset coming to it. And that's, that's where the benefits come from this. And that's when, I, that's when that's happening in the teams I work with. That's what just, you know, you go home with a skip in your step and a smile on your face. It's just great. Um, I'm not sure I answered the question, but I, I filled out some time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, hi, um, yeah, my name is Peter, and um, this is more a question to everyone and not just to Bill. Um, so I like the analogy, and I'm one of those pesky user experience designers, and I, I very much prefer the process that's illustrated here on the screen. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges in, in my design process is that I sometimes have clients that follow an agile process, and I, I really don't think those two processes overlap very um, nicely. Um, Can you just, sorry to interrupt, you, you, you used the key word that I missed. They, your clients use a what process? Agile. Agile, yes. So in, in your analogy, um, construction would start in two week sprint, right when the model is still envisioned and built. Um, and we are supposed to keep up with that as designers. And so I, I can't see this really working properly. And I think there's a lot of pitfalls in that, but I, I wanted to hear everyone's opinion on it. <laughs> Yeah. Um. All right. I, I, uh, I'm a pretty vulnerable target right here. If I gave you my, <laughs> if we were speaking candidly, and after a couple of drinks tonight, you ask me a question again, I might be a bit more honest. Um, okay. So, first of all, how many people have are, have worked? And or work in, uh, in extreme programming, or agile programming, in, in scrums and stuff like that. How many don't? Just so okay. So and then the rest of you just don't work. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just come to conferences. Okay. Uh, so you, or you're in management. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh man, I'm dead. So I was waiting to get beaten up by you, and I just realized I beat myself up. Um, so uh, it's interesting. What I love about the whole agile thing is that people talk. And they talk short, fast, and frequent. And how could you complain about that? What I've never understood is how you do architecture of large systems that way. Because at a certain point, you just can't refactor. And my approach, which is a design approach, is that the only way you can engineer the future tomorrow is to have lived in it yesterday. I will repeat that because it sounds like a paradox. The only way to engineer the future tomorrow, that is, build it as product, is to have lived in it yesterday. They sort of say, well, because it's about experience design, so how can I experience it if I haven't lived in it? It's sort of like people ask me all the time, so Bill, tell me about the iPad. What do you think of the iPad? They expect me to say something about it. I refuse to. Now, first of all, I'm not allowed to talk about it because I work for Microsoft. It's, in, it's, just, it's just not appropriate. But, but, but pretend, that what, pretend it was appropriate. I still wouldn't do it. You know why? I haven't used one. And would you evaluate a ski resort from watching ski videos and review it? Would you, if you were a theater reviewer, would you review a play for, news, for the New York Times, assuming you had the gig, if you just watched a, a video of the performance? So why would you think you could, if, if it is about experience design, if you hadn't experienced the product yourself in the appropriate context, even if you just experienced it on a trade show floor, how is that a, how is that a legitimate um, thing. And so this is, this is just me. Same thing about if I'm designing, how do I know my design's any good if I haven't experienced it? So what we try to do all the time is fake it. It's really easy in many cases at the experiential level to figure out clever ways to just use really stupid technologies to do smart things, duct tape, rubber bands, or really expensive technologies. You know, when we were designing a package, an interactive package, when I was at SGI, that was going to take a couple of years to develop, I just said, put a reality engine on everybody's desk, even though it costs $50,000, and assume it costs the same as a PC. Because by the time we ship, that's the compute power. And if you use the PC of the day for the developers and the testing, even though it's ridiculously expensive, you have to do that because you're going to build the perfect solution for, for two years ago product. Moore's law is real. It's going to keep going. 
You can do this in many different ways in terms of prototyping, but you have to live it before you can build it. And, and so you can use different techniques. But the, but the other part about the scrum is that it's this notion you're, you come along and you refactor it and you go backwards in there. Whereas the design approach says, no, no, if I, I want to do five different prototypes simultaneously or else I'm not doing design because I can't have that design process. And so it's, there's a really tricky challenge there. Once I get down to engineering and smaller groups and smaller problems, it might be a good thing. Can't say. But that's, that's my opinion. I, but is it, nobody's throwing anything at me yet. Um, what usually when I do this, when the, the, re, the, the people from Agile programming say, well, Bill, you're just in the old-fashioned waterfall uh, technique, and we all know that doesn't work. You know, look at Toyota. That was actually my favorite thing now. So it's, it's, uh, you know, have you read anything? And, and, uh, and I say, well, yeah, actually, though, but you know what? I'm Canadian, and I actually happen to know that you can go both directions on a waterfall. And I'm an ice climber, and I have crampons, and I do have ice tools, and I have a bunch of titanium ice screws, and damn it, I can go up as well as down. So thank you very much. Waterfalls are just fine. Um, um, but it's, you know, that's serious playfulness or playful seriousness when I, when I say that. The, it, the question is, is that there's no single technique has worked. The, as I said before, the most important thing in design is the appropriate technique and approach to whatever product you're doing, and that varies from project to project, and that's the most important thing you design on any product. Sorry, I'm taking too long. Yeah, so um, I want to go back to probably your construction analogy a little bit yeah. and also talk about some of your answer to the first question. You talked about establishing a, a minimum level sort of a, a professional. Can everybody hear? Oh, can sorry. you get closer? I, I can hear echoing here. I just can't okay. hear myself. Okay. So back to your first question a little bit, uh, the answer you took about establishing a minimum level of, of professional skill. Right in the construction analogy, you've got this, this covenant with the public through certification and all other kind of stuff. Um, we've seen sort of attempts at that for software, and, and, and I'm not aware of in the design space, but there may be something similar. Um, where an external agency, in fact, becomes sort of the arbiter of you have a minimum level of, of, of skill to do these kinds of things. And, and some of that's true, right, because if the structural engineer is bad, then people could die, right? Mm -hmm. If software architecture is bad, then maybe companies die, but maybe people don't. Um, so, so what I'm interested in is from the development side of things, uh, I think the appeal of the designer involvement through the entirety of the process is, is very strong, but development firms in general have a difficult time eval uh, evaluating developer talent, right? And that's, that's what we do. So how do we evaluate designer talent and how do we understand who has a certain level of that professional skill and who's not just okay. you know, a hobbyist or something like that? Okay, really good question. All right, how many people here consider themselves UX designers or designers? Okay, watch the hands, kids. No, keep your hands up. How many of you are managed by anybody who has, is a design professional? Isn't that interesting? That's, and that's actually higher than I expected. Um, first of all, yes, uh, there is a challenge, and it's a very real one, and I don't at all mean to make light of it. What I just did in the show of hands was to get a, a, a snapshot, a, a rough snapshot of the state of the world right now. We've got to live with what we, we, we got to, it is what it is, right? Computer science is a fairly well developed discipline now. We've got core curricula established, basic uh, levels that if you've got a degree from a credible university, I can take for granted that you have certain core skills. <clears throat> so, the challenge on the design side with interaction design. Design is the same way if we're talking about graphic design, illustration, painting, architecture even. In interaction design, this isn't an experience design, that's not true. We're, we are in that design discipline today where industrial design was in 1929 when the first uh, industrial design firms were opened up in the United States, where uh, Raymond Loy, uh, Henry Dreyfus and, and Walter Doran Teague started up their practices. They, you know, Teague came from uh, 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 graphic design, uh, Dreyfus came from theater design on Broadway, and, uh, and Loy came from uh, fashion. 
they were unusual people who crossed over. They made it up as they went along. They hired people from bizarre things in the way that IEO does, and they invented a profession. When they started to get traction, they then got involved with the design schools and helped establish curriculum. So there was, in fact, a um, factory so on to, to feed employees uh, you know, and train them, uh, and, and they did that. We are only starting to get to that stage right now. And so if you are having trouble finding qualified designers with the right expertise, there's, there's no accident. We're, we're in an inflection point, and, uh, and I think people of my age and experience, it's part of our job to work with schools to help get the curriculum going so that we can, in fact, fill the demands that the technology to make require. The challenge then comes down to how do you deal with um, the management thing in the meantime. And the problem I have is that in many cases, uh, would you allow a, in a development team, assuming design though is a distinct discipline and it brings different special skills, would it be acceptable to have somebody from the Rhode Island School of Design manage uh, the people who are designing the data structures for, for a real-time system, right? And, uh, and making all the technical decisions. And I think that uh, that probably wouldn't go over very well. And yet they, they both have the same number of years as for education, the designer and the engineer. So why, would it, why is it any more or less appropriate for an engineer with the same number of years of education to manage the design decisions? Right? And that's the part that I find I'm uncomfortable with. There are people out there, I think it's really important to enfranchise them. How do you know if somebody's a good designer? You know what, you let a designer make that decision. You don't let an engineer make that decision. And, and so you have to bootstrap the system. You have to prime, you have to find the first one. So find a senior one uh, and, and, and let them start to do their own hiring and live or die. And their job and everything depends on how good their decisions are. That's what you do with the CFO and other things like that. And I think that that's, the, that's what the companies that have succeeded have, have done. Or, they, or you find somebody who's performed or gone, you, you poach them. But um, the main thing is, is that there are standards in design. It's just a different calculus than in other disciplines. And there are people who understand that calculus, they have critiques, there are standards, and there are people who are senior and junior, and, 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 and it doesn't matter, because the designers have no idea whether somebody's a good computer scientist or not. They're amazed that you can type, you know. Um, and, and, and you can, of course, way more than that. That's the best I can say. It, we have to make it up. We don't have to have solve it. It doesn't have to be perfect. We just have to be aware of the problem so we can start to address it at the fastest rate we can without, without unnecessary disruption. But it's a good question, and it's on the back of my mind all the time. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm from a small, cold country called Sweden. Uh, hey, Doc. <laughs> no, he always goodbye. Oh, okay. <laughs> you didn't get my message then. <laughs> no, you have to understand the major thing about creativity is turning the bug into the feature. No, um, carry on. <laughs> So, do you have any <laughs> thoughts on uh, geographic design inspiration? Any sources for design inspiration? I'll tell you my favorite design book, just that captures it in a nutshell. It's a really cheap book and I love it. It's called Art and Fear. Okay. And uh, you can get it. It's, uh, it's been published a million times. You can get it used on Abe books, and you can, but it's cheap enough to buy new. It's a paperback. And it's a really good little book. And, um, and there's another book, if you want, on an experience design that I like a lot that isn't well known. It's written by a guy named Scott Jensen. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think it's called this Innovation something or other. I don't know, but it's, a, it's a small book, but it's Scott Jensen, and somebody's probably got a laptop open and find it. And if you do, call it out. And, but it's, there are two, each one you can read in the evening. But the question was specifically on. Geographic design inspiration. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Geographic design. Yes. How do you mean? I mean, um, taking Sweden and taking Las Vegas, it's two radically different places. One is yeah. uh, golden sand everywhere, and the other one, polar bears are fighting in the street, basically. Can we do something with that? Can we uh, take inspiration from, from the differences in our climate, in our countries, in our cultures, and integrate it into our user experiences in any way? I really hope so, because otherwise the world's going to get really bland. And, but and I, we're making a very simple and look-alike experience with Windows Phone 7. I think that the nice thing there is that there is a chance to maybe 
um, by adding things, personalize it. So I, I'm not making light of this, and I'm not saying that we're. At, it would be nice if, first of all, we could make something that could design well for even one culture. <laughs> and, but then, the, and then, but 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 for, for I. Here's, here's where, what you're saying struck me. The first time I went to India, uh, when I was working for s on the th this SGI and alias, was that is what was amazing. They, they, the people I visited had taken, the filmmakers who, who I was visiting, they'd taken all this technology that we developed, and man, they'd made it their own. And I, I come from Canada, where we, there's this border, this country below us, and, and we're, you know, it's like, we're very, um, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by culturally from what comes from the states to Canada, and uh, and it's and so there's this sort of thing about trying to maintain your your culture and um, whatever that may be. So when I went to India, it was fascinating to me how well they'd maintained core values in terms of just everything about everything still was Indian even though it came from the same technologies. And I, was, and I started looking at asking exactly the same question. What can I learn from India that I could bring to other cultures to do what they're doing? What are they doing right, assuming it was right and that it was conscious, to, to, to have that type of identity, even though there was a commonality of tools that, that, were, that, that were employed, and it was a question of attitude. And I think um, I don't have any simple solutions, but the more I travel the world and look, I watch for those things to try and understand them so that, so that I, when I see opportunities, so I can have a chance to learn to how to be more effective. But it is absolutely clear, I, I don't think I said this, I, I've said this once today, but it wasn't in my keynote. It's just simple, I mean, there's some stupid little things. This is the most trivial thing at all, but in the original graphics interfaces, you had these toggle switches that were icons that looked like toggle light switches, that on was up and off was down. I don't know what it's like in Sweden, but in Germany, down is on, and up is off. And even something as simple as that has strong cultural roots, and, and you just start to confuse and pervert, you know, in a weird way. It's a mis there's a impedance mismatch between the iconography and, and so on, and the design and the, and the culture to which the machine's targeted. And, and I think it's, it's unfortunate if, we, if that persists. It's not necessary, because I'd like I, I would hate it if the world became uniform, as I'm sure you are. Um, and yet there's this part of working together and compatibility. Those are balances that I think those are things that are, are things that the kinds of questions that I think are worth spending serious time thinking about and, and, and taking into account when we have the tools. But it's like this 12-step program. The first thing I have to say, you know, my name is Bill, I'm an alcoholic, or I build uh, you know, bland uh, universal interfaces. Uh, um, <laughs> Um, and maybe I'm going to try and fix it. And so now at least I can start the 12-step program, whatever that may be. But maybe that's the next thing we design. I don't have a good answer, but, it, but it's, it's... Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Sabrina, and I was uh, really interested to hear you talking about, you know, the different aspects of the B, the X, and the T, and everybody bringing creativity to those disciplines. And speaking from my own experience, I've seen lots of creativity sort of brought to the X and the T, and very little of it brought to the B part, mm -hmm. the business aspect. And I was um, going to ask you if you could talk a little bit about what that actually looks like when it happens. Yeah, so, I, uh, boy, there's a little c company down in Silicon Valley called Google that I think did a pretty good job at it. Um, <laughs> now, but but, but I, let's, let's, let's be, I, I, I can talk about Google. Um, <laughs> I, I respect our competitors, right? And the thing that's really interesting is their design's okay. It's not great. Their search engine at the beginning was good, but it wasn't that good. Their business model was, was pretty good, but it, on its own. But when you took the three together and they figured out how to get the right mix, they did okay. And, uh, and I think that... Um, you know, the first thing that I try to do when I try to understand these things is start looking for case studies about companies that have had a really interesting transformative business model um, and, and companies where there was an interaction between the business model and the technology and, and the design. And 
so rather than answer the question, which I, I, I which, which, which would, because there's no, there's, there is no single answer, to understand the space of the question is maybe a better way to formulate it, would be to start doing this as an exercise, maybe every Friday afternoon with your team or at lunch, have lunch together, and, and where you come up with what are examples, and let's start plotting them, put them on the board, and then sorting them and sort of seeing what are the attributes here so we can actually start to see what is the interplay and what and is it in fact an interesting business model. I think um, where we're going in terms of um, the challenges are, for example, what's, what's going to happen as things go digital, there's some really interesting things that are going to compel this change. Here's, I don't want to depress the hell out of you, but I have a friend, Roger Martin, he's a very well known a guy in, in business and design of business and so on. He's the dean at the Rotman School of Business in Toronto, but he's published a number of really good books. He points something out to me, and it says that there's a law of economics which is uh, essentially as solid as the law of supply and demand. And it says that in any market where all the things are equal, when products are there, that the lowest priced vendor is the one who sets the effective price of the, that commodity. And that that is true even if the lowest price vendor has a business model that makes no sense. And they will drag down the price from everybody and can in fact really hurt the industry and, and development. And the next part of this that's interesting is that if, there, if the costs of goods, the COGS, not the cost of development but the goods themselves, the material part, approaches zero, it is inevitable that the cost of that commodity will go to zero unless there's a monopoly. So let's assume there's not a monopoly. If the cost of goods equals zero, it is inevitable the price will go to zero. What this says is, is that what the music pirates were doing in the, to the music industry, they, it may have been bad or good or may have been illegal or not. I'm not going to comment on that. But if they did anything, all they did is accelerate, not cause the fact that music was going to be free. Or, or approach free. And because it fits that law, because there's no cost of goods. But what's really interesting is that that says that that's true with anything that's entirely digital. Microsoft's been stuck with that in terms of why you, in the software industry, where you don't see CD ROMs in shrink wrap in stores much anymore. Um, and, and the commodity, and so it's very hard to make commodity software. Price goes to zero. Um, video, newspapers, books, every single medium that's going digital assume that the price is going to go to zero or near zero. And you start saying, holy crap, we're out of jobs. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, who's going to pay us for the advertising if the things that are being advertised are being sold on the web and zero? They, well, there's no revenue, so okay, right? There's some real challenges here. I'm not trying to do the same, but I'm saying this is why you need to understand economics and the business side and then start to think about your business, not in the old sort of retail here, and how you start to say, how do we monetize? How do we bring value and things like that? And these are really hard questions. And, and if you, s how in a digital economy, when everything tends, wants to be free, does anybody afford to send their kids to school? And, uh, and, what, and what is worth, where is value, what's worth paying for? And these are really hard questions. And, uh, but they, but my view is if uh, I gave a talk recently to some journalists and sort of said, so if, if, we design, if I designed an e-book and that and, and gave you the perfect reading experience, there's every chance that just at the point where we had the perfect digital reading experience, there's nothing new worth reading because nobody could make a living as an author. Right? Or, and, or, or, and, and furthermore, there'd be no, and there's no professional journalists and therefore this could have a serious impact on democracy, right, in terms of newspapers. And, and so there's this, it's a very delicate ecosystem as we do these things. And if we don't have a balanced and a holistic view of the larger ecosystem, I think we could make some very bad and very serious decisions. And, uh, and I don't take them lightly. And I think it involves, and it's not, it's not appropriate that these are made by engineers or just uh, business people, but, but, but even how to make the right business decisions that work are, and fit our values is, is a really interesting thing. And we have more impact on, and I just did an interview earlier and it sort of said about some essay I'd written about 
digital as a cultural artifact. And if you compare how we discuss music, theater, art, dance, cinema, um, literature, in newspapers, review it, talk about it. You always, you won't be taken seriously if you don't discuss this thing in terms of this larger social, cultural, economic context. And from history, where we are now, where we're heading, what our values are, blah, blah, blah. And then compare that to how we review digital technologies and think about that and discuss it. And then you say, well, of these, which ones are gonna have the most impact on our culture over the next 20 years or 30 years or 50 years? We have serious conversations here, and we don't at all here. If you reviewed a book by Margaret Atwood, um, the way we reviewed digital technology is say, well, it has a cover, it fits in my purse or briefcase, the pages turn without falling out. There's a very nice luminance contrast between the ink and the paper, so you can see it. Nice 12 point font, look at those serifs. And uh, by the way, uh, nice color, um, and there's a story in it. And, and I, I extreme, but it's, it's this notion about this holistic view, and this is why we need these different disciplines around and informing our decisions we make in these T-shaped people, not just in these three, uh, in order to understand the larger knock-on effects of the, of the things we do. Uh, my, one of my heroes is a uh, historian of technology named Melvin Kranzberg, and he has, his, he has a number of laws, but his first law, which I just love, and I, if you've heard me say it again before, it's because I almost say it every time I have a chance, is that technology is not good, it's not bad, but nor is it neutral. It will have an impact. And Buxton's corollary to that, or as in Canada, as we say, corollary, um, is that with that informed design, it's more likely to be bad than good. And if you say, well, what do we need to know to inform that, those decisions? And that involves the whole thing around, and about with it, all aspects of it, uh, is, is trying to think about things in a holistic sense. What we make collectively, the people in this room, is some of the most culturally impactful things um, that are being made today, bar none. Far outstrip rock and roll, in my view. And, it's, uh, and, uh, and we shouldn't take that lightly. And, but it's also, it, but like Spider-Man says, with great responsibility comes great power. With power comes great responsibility. Now, how do we do that? And I think design has a very important role to play there. I, and I totally went away from your question. But that's a tactic. Hi, my name is Urban. I'm also from Sweden. From a, I'm a business developer for a consulting business there. Yeah. And uh, leading up to my question, uh, I think uh, as a comment to the earlier question about design, waterfall, and agile programming, uh, we've in successful projects we've been able to combine the two. Basically, yeah. you start with the design process, and once you get to basically where your construction starts, there you go into more of an agile program. Um, but the problem is that <clears throat> this only works when the, when the customer is aware of this yes. and doesn't have a problem with it. So my question is really how we, as a consulting firm, can be better at convincing our customers because basically we have to justify doing this, having a proper design process by a business case, which is the traditional way. And so we try to implement like change management and how to sort of change the whole organization and thinking in these ways, and showing the direct effects in sales, perhaps if it's an external thing or just productivity and the results or just an efficient process, but it is actually very, very hard. And, and it's a cultural change thing. And I'm just wondering if you have any tips and tricks or thoughts on this. It's a hard question. For me, the, the, the way that I try to approach that in terms of dealing with management or, customer, or, or clients is it's a lot about storytelling and, and case studies. So. And I try to make things that are far away from their business. Tell them the story, get them to see the moral of the story, the reason for the story. Once they've bought into it, then reel it in to say, oh, and by the way, this is what you do. This is how it applies. If I had have used a software engineering project here, we have far more biases in our safeguards and defense mechanisms would be far more in place than if we have the further things are removed. And that's why most of the examples I use come from things that are outside. Um, that's one approach to things. Um, I, I think often what we need to do is also maybe get a bit better at understanding um, to be able to quantify things. Uh, let's look at um, the economics of uh, things. In my, if I think of as a researcher, which is what I really am as opposed to a designer, it's a, wear different hats, but it, as a researcher, um, why would 
any company spend money on long-term 20-year out research, uh, in, especially in a tight times, where you go short? Well, because there's a, I, I, then I go and try and read the economic literature to understand there's a guy named Mansfield who showed that if you go into shorter term, more applied research, that actually productivity goes down rather than up. And if you can start to quantify and, and give data to help the customer, then it ceases to be, it's my gut reaction, it's your opinion versus mine. How do I actually get solid case studies, solid examples, solid data that can support that? And I think that then, and if I can get it emotionally removed first, then, then we, uh, we've got a better chance of, of making a case for a change in methodology. The other thing is, is that I always say, if, if, as, if you, as an athlete or something like that, is that um, I, I, in meetings where people are saying, thinking they're being really innovative and doing really creative things and how they're going to beat the competition, and, and this is a nice conversation to have with your clients too, to sort of say, okay, we're having this conversation now. Who are your competitors? What schools did they go to? Oh, that's interesting. That's the same schools we went to. What journals did they subscribe to or magazines did they read? Oh, we, we do the same things. Uh, what do we do? What do we watch? And so on and so forth. And you can realize that, so what gives us the arrogance to believe that they're not having exactly the same meeting we're having right now? Right? They're, they're the same. And so unless you've got a really good thing that says why I believe we're doing something fundamentally different, because of course we're comparing this great idea for our new thing to what they're shipping today. They're doing the same thing to us. And we have no idea what they're going to be shipping tomorrow. It's a Dilbert kind of situation, right? And, um, and so now we come back and sort of say, well, if we're not doing something fundamentally different and taking a different approach, then the chances are they're having the same meeting. And so when we come out with our new improved widget, it's going to be in exactly the same position, plus or minus a couple percent, as the balance of power was before we even started. It's just... Uh, we're not going to change the balance of power in a, in a serious way. So how do you want to do that? Now, if you don't want to take my advice, that's fine, but what else are you going to offer that says you were truly going to get competitive advantage, take market share, or go to the next level in terms of the company so that we can you know, send our kids to college or whatever? And I think those are the types of things we just have to learn how to do, and that, that's part of the design process. We have to design our stories, as, again, just like we do our products. Um, that's, the, that's kind of the, that, that's the best I can characterize how I, how I, on a daily basis, do that. And there's realms of creativity of how you can do that. Um, and I mean, typically, though, the issues come up with examples like that one, which is a public building where you don't typically have a, um, a financial goal in terms of making yeah. money out of that and so forth. And that's always easier to get that kind of analogy, but it doesn't fly when it comes to that perspective. So I could, I could say... Um, I, I, I definitely look at companies like Palm. I think Palm is a wonderful company. I think it's a company where if you look at it, most of it, what's been written about it, by the way, most of what has been written about Apple is, is, uh, misses the whole point, but I'll take Palm as an example because it's more interesting. Already, Jeff Hawkins is a genius and so on and so forth. Look at the Palm. It has all these things, a few functions, fits in your pocket, all that stuff. That's not why it was successful. It was successful because Jeff realized one fundamental thing. The problem with pen-based or PDAs in general, was if you lost them, you were screwed. That the Palm, what made it successful, because everybody, there were lots of other companies that had what they had, you know, in, in any meaningful sense. It was the fact you could photocopy the entire contents in less than a minute with one button push. It was hot sync. And therefore, it took away the fear factor that if you dropped it out of your pocket into the lake, out of your canoe or whatever, you were out the depreciated cost of $200, and you didn't lose any of your work, and you could get it right back. And the company paid for it in the first place, so who cares about the, the device? It's my data, my address book. The company can't replace that. And that's what they, that, that was the brilliance. And nobody, nobody talks about that when they do the case study. The problem with that market growing wasn't one of, of technology, of, of the performance of the primary functions. It was the, it was, it was the, and it was the, e, it was the change. There was a couple orders of magnitude easier to get things from your existing address book into this device and to photocopy it so if you lost the device, you were still okay. And recognizing those types, it was a trust relationship. That, those are the things that really, 
were the caused the dynamics of change. And by the way, Palm clobbered Microsoft with the Palm Pilot. Microsoft was releasing the um, their, their handheld devices, uh, the CE devices, at exactly the same time. It was exactly the same time Microsoft was being nailed for monopolistic unfair trade practices and all this sort of stuff. Nobody could compete with this. Hell, Palm in that market just clobbered Microsoft. They had like something like 85% market share because they got that right, right? And, the, and, and, and that's, they deserve it. They did a really good job. So it's how we look at these things. And when we go back to case studies and don't take all of, the, there's a huge stack of literature here about these things and don't take it as fact. You step back and use critical thinking and say there's another way to look at this. If I look at Apple, look at all the stuff that's written about it, the key thing there was it happened with talent that was already there. Jonathan Ive was at Apple when John Scully was there. He was the industrial designer on the Newton. All of the talent was there in that company. It was how they organized themselves that turned it around, and every part was functioning, from the people who did the marketing to the, to, to, to the people who did the production line, and so on and so forth. And these are the parts that aren't in, in almost any of the literature that's written about that. If you can be as creative in terms of how you interpret the facts in a different way, see the world in a different way, then that's the essence of creativity. Then you get the insights that make it so what you do aren't different. And, and if you can bring that to your clients and explain to them, if you know more about your client's business and your client about things that could impact their ability to grow, you will get their attention and they will do your way right off the bat. I guess that's the fastest, I should have said that right off the bat and it could have saved five minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Michael from Austria, I mean Australia. Um, so uh, the Windows 7 uh, mobile uh, the yep. phone, um, I think is a wonderful device from both the experience and the technology point of view. Um, and in talking with some of the Microsoft people, you know, they're like, we're not trying to clone the iPhone, uh, which I think is a fair statement to make. Um, but anyone looking at it, it's obvious that there are things that have been learned from the experience that Apple tried to produce in that device. Yep. And so I'm wondering if you can talk to, as a designer, the balance and the approach between looking at things that exist versus innovation and so forth on those new ideas and how you try to take a product beyond just copying something that exists. Yep. Um, there's a difference between, uh, you know, first of all, learning and adopt, ad, 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 incorporating prior art is part of evolution of everything. Um, I think I showed this maybe last year, but the way they packaged, colored, and marketed the iPod Mini uh, at Apple came directly from Walter Dorman Teague with a thing called the vanity camera that, well, that from 1932, if I remember. Um, a lot of stuff uh, comes from, is based on uh, stuff from uh, uh, Braun, I'm just blanking for the moment, um, Dieter Rams. I, uh, that, that, that's appropriate. I admire because Jonathan Ive understands the history of industrial design. Um, all of these things come. If you look at, you know, a lot of stuff that is on the iPhone and things, the sweeping of images across, that came from a product I did called the Portfolio Wall that we released several years earlier. Uh, Multi-touch came much, much earlier. So there's this, everything builds on top of everything else, so that's not a bad thing. Um, what happens is, is that there's key landmark products that pop above the radar and somehow because they got a number, enough things right that, they, that those ideas stick to them and that's actually good business. Um, but don't, don't confuse good marketing and good business with good, sci good history. And the history is a very different thing. Now there's a lesson to be learned for that if we know the difference between history and, and marketing and then we can sort of say well, that's interesting. So that means that there's all these really good ideas out there that we can pick up. We can take them, incorporate them into our new product, and if we can learn how those other companies did it, they will stick to us. So how do you make the ideas stick so you're the genius who actually got the things put together even though they were out there before? I think that many people, when the iPhone came out, a lot of companies sort of said, well, wow, uh, that's new. That's already, you can already do that. We've got to cut right now. So, um, but the fact is, is that they made it stick, and they did a really good job. Uh, 
I've got to stop. And so this is the correct time to say, hey, Doe. And uh, uh, we've got to stop because we're out of time. And thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>